So as we continue to study mystics, these individuals that have shaped our faith, uh, not only from ancient of days, but even to the contemporary times, we're inviting ourselves into this realm of the spirit that oftentimes people only think of monks and nuns are invited into. And today we look at Thomas Merton, a monk who lived in the last century, who uh, was um, a, a, a monk who lived outside of Kentucky, in Louisville, Kentucky, and was a monk most of his adult life. And he was the one who really brought forth the new monastic movement, the reinvigoration of the monastics, of those mystics and the ways of the mystics, it is not that they had been, they had disappeared. It was just that we had forgotten what our tradition had always been about. And Thomas started to write prolifically and sharing what he was doing in his own life and what we had access to in our own lives. He was deeply influenced by the Desert Fathers that we studied two weeks ago. Of these monks that left the confines of the cities and went into the desert and dwelled with God there, most unlearned, but deeply faithful, that shaped and formed the rest of our scriptures, and specifically the theologians that came after. And last week we looked at St. Francis of Assisi, and the impact that he had in the 1200s in the life of our faith. And today we look at Thomas Merton, who is really the, the catapult for much of what's happening in the Christian realm today, and the, the movement that is going on all around us all the time. And Thomas Merton wrote over 60 books in his life, and of not only his writings of books, he also was the author of hundreds of poems. He was a poet as well. At the end of his life, they found journals, and every day he journaled throughout his whole entire life, and they made it into volumes by year of his journals, profound insights. And for three years, he left the monastery and the other monks and went and lived alone in silence and wrote and wrote and wrote. So we're going to look at a couple of the books today, uh, and specifically what he taught us. Uh, this is one that if you like to read or want to grow deeper and understand what in the world is contemplation all about, this is called New Seeds of Contemplation. I would highly suggest you go to Amazon and buy it. I don't know if the local Christian bookstore carries it. If they don't, they should. Uh, this is a profoundly deep book. You will not read it fast, because every page you end up with a gazillion markings in it because of the depth of wisdom and life that he infuses. Another book of his uh, is an interesting, it's called The Seven Story Mountain. It's this, his autobiographical story of his own faith and uh, experience. It's much thicker. So if you like a good thick book to read, here's your book. But it's interesting to hear about the story of his life. Uh, and the last one, if you're not much of a reader, ta-da! 94 pages, and it is called Contemplative Prayer, and it is a great, great book. Uh, another one that you read slowly, though it's short, and you underline it like crazy, and you go back to it and read it again, because it is a little tool to help you touch something much deeper that's always around us. And so Thomas Merton, what do we know about the guy? Well, he lived all over the world, and then uh, as an adult, felt a call from God and decided to become a Trappist monk. This is a group of monks that are very simple in nature. Uh, there's not a whole lot of Trappist monasteries in the U.S., uh, but they're based out of originally uh, Trappé, I think, France. I'm so bad at foreign languages, so forgive me. Um, and, and this movement came as a, as a rebirth of the monastic movement about uh, in the era of St. Francis of Assisi. And out of that movement came these individuals that sought solitude, but also simplicity in their lives that they could connect with God. And so what is, it, what is it that this man has given to us that is so profoundly impactful to our faith? Uh, I did a video this week that I, uh, my heart rate was at about 190 the whole time, uh, and I was staying up on top of a ladder, like congruent or even with those chandeliers, and I'm terrified of heights. And so even being not that high, I, like, it was horrible. And they kept saying, I think we should do it again. And finally, I just was like, no! Because my foot was falling asleep, and Kelly had just talked the day before about ladder safety, and I wasn't following any of the rules. And so I was going to get in trouble with Kelly, and I didn't want to go to the timeout corner of the staff offices. Uh, but he has this quote that is pretty profound, and I want to read it once, 
and for you to listen to it, and the second time to really listen to it, okay? So the first time, people may spend their whole lives climbing the ladder of success only to find, once they have reached the top, that the ladder is leaning against the wrong wall. <clears throat> Read it again. People may spend their whole lives climbing the ladder of success only to find, once they reach the top, that the ladder is leaning against the wrong wall. What is he saying? My experience as a minister is I get to talk story with lots of people and hear about their lives. I've met more people than I can count who have set their sights on lofty goals and achieved them to only find out when they achieve it that there's no meaning in it. There's no heart to it. There's no sense of fulfillment in it. And what they're doing is standing at the pinnacle of the ladder and looking over and going, oops, that's what I really wanted over there. What Merton is trying to do is to say that success isn't bad. It's not a statement about success. But it's a statement about what are we pursuing with our lives? What is it that we're longing for and what is it that we're trying to attain? His statement is this profound statement that I have thought about over and over again throughout my personal life because at the end of the day, when we come to the end of our lives or the end of this part of our journey, how do we know that we have followed the way of God and we're at a place that we can stand without a shadow of doubt regardless of the success that we have achieved or not and say we are lined up with God's will and following God's way. And so Merton invites us into this way called contemplation. Now, some of you are going to hear the word contemplation and think, I'm not a monk or a nun, nor do I want to be. Amen? Amen. Contemplation oftentimes has been uh, positioned as something that only those kinds of people can do. And instead, we've missed the actual art of contemplation. Contemplation is not the goal to empty your brain of all information, to sit in nothingness. Instead, it is to focus ourselves on that which is most important, of finding the core, the center of that which we are, and discovering in the midst of it that God is already there. If you can throw up the slide that's way at the end of the Christ before us uh, language. Last week, we sang it together after communion. Uh, at the two other services, every week, we grab hands at the end of every worship service, and we sing this refrain together. It's from St. Patrick. Uh, anybody ever heard of St. Patrick? St. Patrick's Day, right? St. Patrick, that's St. Patrick. He didn't have green beer all the time, just so you know. St. Patrick was a prolific writer and deep thinker as well. And so each week, uh, if you can put it up, uh, this is what we sing together. And I want you to listen to where is God, okay? So we're going to say it together. We're not going to sing it. We're going to say it. And listen for where is God, okay, ready? Christ beside us. Christ before us, Christ behind us, King of our hearts. Christ within us, Christ below us, Christ above us, never to part. Where's God? Everywhere, all the time, God is. And what Burton and the, the mystics instruct us and invite us into is being awakened to what is already around you. And not just around you, but in you. An awakening, as some will call the spiritual experience. An awakening to that which already is. And so the way that Merton says it about contemplation is this. Contemplation is the highest expression of man's and woman's intellectual and spiritual life. It is that life itself, fully awake, fully active, fully aware that it is alive. It is spiritual wonder. It is spontaneous awe at the sacredness of life, of being. It is a vivid realization of the fact that life and being in us proceed from an invisible, transcendent, and infinitely abundant source. Contemplation is above all awareness of the reality of that source. It knows the source. Or to make it much easier, he said one sentence that's quite simple. Action is the stream of our lives. 
and contemplation is the spring. Action is the stream, the outflow of our lives. But contemplation is the spring that feeds it. Next week, we're going to study a guy by the name of Richard Rohrer. Uh, and Richard has, yeah, I'm super excited. You'll understand why next week. Uh, but Richard Rohrer is this uh, guy that's living in, in New Mexico right now. And he has this profound idea. The problem with most monks and nuns is all they do is contemplate and they don't do anything. And the problem with the rest of Christendom is all they do is do, and they never think about it. And the idea is that we have to learn how to have both and at the same time. That we contemplate as the source so that we know that which we're to do. The prayer that you read of Merton's is not this idea that as long as I just keep moving forward, then God's going to be happy with me. It's that out of the contemplative life comes this stream that makes it clear where I'm to walk. And sometimes it doesn't make sense, but I just keep walking. And so he invites you and I into this place of contemplation. And so what is the goal of contemplation? What is the goal of our lives? What is the purpose of God putting on this beautiful earth to dwell together in unity and in oneness together? Well, you heard the passage from 1 John. You want to take a stab at the three words that defines that passage? You all get brownies in heaven for that answer. Well, I don't know what's for, for snacks afterwards, but maybe you have brownies after church too. God is love. In 1 John, over and over again, it's a statement. God is love. 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 If you want to understand the essence of God, it's not some romantic idealism. It's the reality that we are found in a story of great love. That from the beginning of creation, God births the creation out of great love. That God sends Jesus into the world out of great love. That we are redeemed out of great love. That we cannot run from it. We can't ignore it. Well, we can. We do all the time. But we can't earn it or lose it. It is. And so look at your neighbor and say, you are loved. All right, say it with love and passion and compassion. One, two, three. Say to your neighbor, you are loved. Okay? Good news. You are loved. If you summarize the whole gospel, all the scriptures into two words, we said it last week, those words are love wins. That's the story of the gospels. Love always wins. Uh, love always overwhelms darkness and evil. Love wins because God is at work among us. And so as we look at this, the way that Merton tries to invite us into is to into this stream of love that is always around us. And through contemplation, we find the tools in order to tap into or to awaken to that which is already here. That's above us and below us. It's in front of us and behind us. It's within us. And that we're awakening to it. And how are the world around us supposed to know who we are? Not by how we preach it, how evil everyone is. Not by judging other people. How did it say? Did you read it? By the manner in which we love one another. Isn't it profoundly hard to do that? And I always wonder, especially this time of year, when you uh, God forsaken elections. I know that you all love election time, but I'm just like, oh my God. Come back, please. Do something, a miracle. The reason is, it's amazing how many God-loving, Bible-thumping, I'm a Christians are mean-spirited and hurtful this time of year. And I always open up these scriptures like, where do we get that? The question for me is, how do we tap into this spring of love that's flowing all around us? all the time. The struggle that we have, if we're really honest, is that you and I know how to play the game. We know how to wear the mask. We know how to say the right things in the right context. 
And the way that he talks about that is that we live into our false self. Not the true self of who we were created to be, but instead we put on these masks that hide ourselves from each other. And so we used to live in a part of the country that's known as the Bible Belt. God bless the Bible Belt. But I was always amazed how many people would be like, you know, how you doing? Oh, I'm so blessed. Life's amazing. God's so good. And they never had a problem in their life. And I always looked in the mirror and was like, what is wrong with me? Because some days I'm kind of grumpy. Some days I'm happy. I I'm like the seven dwarfs, right? <laughs> Anyone else? I don't remember what all seven are, so I don't know. if that Seven, right? Yeah, seven dwarfs. <laughs> Sneezy. Yeah, I get that allergy season. <laughs> yeah, all right. But we're people that are peeling away this false self. The deeper we go with God. Like an onion, what we're trying to find is that core. And that core is actually who you are. And that we live through that core, and that's what is revealed among us. That who we are here is who we are when we go out in the parking lot. And when we get on the street and someone cuts us off. Honest to God, this isn't part of the sermon. We serve the church in uh, Oklahoma City, and we built this monstrosity of a building, and it was right at the end of the highway. And it was a traffic nightmare the first Sunday. Uh, everyone was log jammed in the parking lot. Nobody could move. It was like the H1 with an accident. And the police officers came and quit and said, we will never come back to this church. The people that had just worshipped in the building, over 3,000 people, were the meanest people in their cars. And the police officer said, if that's what you're teaching in church, we don't want anything to do with it. <clears throat> right? That's who they really were. Not all of them, but some. And so we're living into and learning how as we contemplate what does it mean to live in our true self. The true is true that we find out that God is. God is love. And we are in a partnership, a connection, a oneness with God. The word that we used two weeks ago, remember it? Big D word. Good job. Deification. Remember? Deification is this idea that God dwells within us. And there's many in the Christian world that be like, oh, that's so new agey. No, this goes back to the early, early, early centuries of the church. That God isn't somewhere out there in the heavens, although that's true. That if God is above and below and behind and in front and within, then God is with us at all times. And so what do we do with this? What do we do with this idea of contemplation? What do we do with this idea that if we are learning how to not live in the false self and live in the true self, we have to be stripped of that which blocks us from the flow that's always around us? We have to awaken to that which already is. And to do that, we have to say, I'm willing. I'm willing. God never forces God's self on us. But instead goes where God is welcomed. And so I'm willing. And at the end of the day, when you're climbing the ladders... When you look at the heights and you get to the top, how do you know that you're at the right wall? Merton says this, the spiritual life is then the perfectly balanced life in which the body with its passionate instincts, the mind with its reasoning and its obedience to principle, and the spirit, the soul, with its passive illumination by the light and love of God form one complete man or woman who is in God and is with God and is from God and is for God. One man in whom God is all in all. One man in whom God carries out his own will without obstacle. What my hope is, is that we are people that are trying to learn what it means to be contemplatives. 
that we're learning how to not be so busy. How many of you today, honest, right, we're getting rid of the onion peels. How many of you thought about a to-do list of what you need to do today? How many of you thought about what time can I get to the beach? How many of you thought about what's on TV later today? Right? All of us do it. I've even thought about today. Right? How do we funnel our energy, our focus, our prayers, so that it's not just a one-way street? Us saying to God, this is what I want and need. But also being open and saying, God, speak. For your servant is listening. And to ensure that we follow and climb the right ladder. So at the end of our lives, we are leaning against the wall and say, wow, thank you. Thank you for life and life in all of its abundance. And so in these moments, I'm going to invite you into silence. As we get ready for a sacred meal, to focus and to repeat what we sang earlier. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves me. And after a moment of silence, Pastor Brandon will come and lead us in communion.